Thank you for joining us for this Bible study. We're going to do a Passover special today titled, Proclaim Liberty Unto the Captives. You know, when I was putting this study together, I intended to show all of the different things Christ accomplished through his death and resurrection. But I soon found out that'd be impossible because I would have to pretty much teach you the entire Bible. And um, we don't have time to do that here today. So what I decided to do was focus in on the price of redemption Christ paid on the cross and his role as kinsman redeemer. And I'm going to start this out by quoting um, from a blog I wrote a little while back titled um, The Relationship Between Law and Prophecy. And we're going to skip down to a subheading there in that article titled The Law, the Law of Kinsman Redeemer. And it reads, All sin is reckoned as debt according to God's law. Matthew 18 verses 21 through 35. When we sin, we accumulate debt and we become debtors. And according to the law, someone who cannot pay off their debt is often forced to sell themselves into slavery until they work off all the debt they owe. Uh, you can see Exodus 22 verses 1 through 3 and Leviticus 25, 47 through 49 on this, uh, on this law here. But if you're thinking, oh, that's not too bad, the multitude of my good works should be able to cover the cost of my sin, then you're sorely mistaken because no amount of good works we do will ever, ever be enough to pay the debt of sin each one of us has accumulated. The, but the good news is, is, is that in his infinite love, God has provided in his law various means of mercy, restoration, and forgiveness one of which is called the Law of the Kinsman Redeemer. Leviticus 25, verses 39 through 55. This law states that if a person be sold into slavery because of debt, then the next of kin, a close relative, may buy that person from their slave master by paying off the debt payment that was owed. In other words, they assumed their relative's debt in order to set them free. Now do you see why God had to send his only begotten son in the world to die upon the cross? Yes, I said had to. Because by the law, when we sin, we become servants of sin. See Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 23. And Satan becomes our taskmaster. And a ruthless taskmaster at that. And legally, that is his right. It is Satan's right to own us when we sin. Because by sinning, We've sold ourselves over to his service. And according to the law, only, o, the only way God can free us from Satan is by, is by becoming our kinsman redeemer and paying the necessary price of redemption. You know, it's fascinating when you look at that. That's why I've often stated here, uh, probably more so of late, uh, since we're studying the book of Deuteronomy, is that it's nearly impossible to rightly divide God's word without understanding the law. Because the law will tell you prophecy. It'll tell you everything that's going to happen because it's a cause and effect relationship. Um, basically, prophecy is nothing more than blessings and cursings based off of um, whether someone's obedient unto the law or whether someone's breaking the law. And then the, the details follow on. But a lot of people think that Christ, came, when Christ came, that he did away with the law. That's not so. And if we have that mentality, we're going to blind ourselves to many of the, um, well, basically the entire Bible, for that matter. Because Christ did not come to, um, to change the law. He didn't come to erase the law. But it is stated in Matthew chapter 5 that he came to fulfill the law. That, mean, that is to say, to fulfill the legal requirements of the law. He came to pay the price of redemption. He came to be our sacrifice for sin. He fulfilled those blood sacrifices and requirements that were necessary according to the law. That's important. It gives us a better idea of what Passover was all about. Because Passover is centered upon the blood of the Lamb which is Jesus Christ, who became our sacrifice 
once and for all. And um, anyways, and that price that he paid on the cross was connected to this role of kinsman redeemer. And we're going to talk about that um, a little bit more in depth here after we get reading a little bit into um, Isaiah chapter 60. Let's go to Isaiah chapter, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1, and it reads, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And if you remember, this is these are the verses, many of you have them in bold here in your Bibles. These are the verses Christ quoted from when he stood in the synagogue and was starting to uh, um, read, do a public reading there. Anyways, he says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. That's what Jesus did when he came here. That's what his ministry was all about. He was preaching the good news of the kingdom to those who were humble, to those who would submit themselves to the laws of Almighty God and, and unto his word. Not unto the scribes and Pharisees who did not actually hold to God's law. They claim, oh, they claimed to follow God's law, but they rather followed the Talmud, the traditions of men, and things like that. And they were hypocrites. But that doesn't mean that the law was done away with just because the scribes and Pharisees claimed to have followed the law. A lot of people get that, that idea. And even if you watch this last series on the Bible um, that the History Channel played, it somewhat portrays the, um, the scribes and Pharisees as though they were ones trying to follow the law. And as though Christ uh, came to do away with the law. But that's not true. The scribes and Pharisees were not following the law. They were violators of the law. They were trying to apply the law unjustly. They were being hypocrites um, and all sorts of things. But again, that's not the truth. Anyways, this is what Christ came. He came to bring good tidings, good news. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to heal people, to bring hope back to people, to bring life and, and, um, and a new spirit. To proclaim, here we go, here's the title of our study, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now let's stop for a little bit here. You know, we have a liberty movement today that uh, many people are aware of and, <coughs> excuse me, still trying to get over a cold here, but what a lot of people fail to realize is that the liberty movement, the true liberty movement started over 2,000 years ago with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That was his message, to proclaim liberty. But he was proclaiming liberty by obedience unto God's word and forgiveness uh, and the forgiveness of our sins by the price he was going to pay. You know, the, the problem we have today, and you hear me often write about it because I am concerned. I'm concerned that those Christians that love liberty and freedom are starting to join themselves together with, um, you know, people agnostics, atheists, and things like and things like that, that that don't believe or that don't understand where true freedom comes from. Those are the kinds of people that think, well, we should just be able to do whatever we want. They don't want any authority over them. They don't want the government telling them what to do. They just want to be free to to live however they want to live. But that's not the liberty our founding fathers envisioned, and it's not the liberty that will ever work. We don't want to unite ourselves, be equally yoked with people of that mindset, with the mindset that man can somehow determine his own morality and be able to have freedom or have the right to be free, the right to liberty. You don't deserve liberty. You do not deserve freedom. Unless you strive to obey the laws of God and upon repentance believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way to freedom. And that's basically one of the main lessons that runs throughout the entire Bible. So Tea Party movement, patriots, Christian patriots, be careful. I suggest, you know, we, we cannot, people who do not believe the same as we do are not going to help us in the long run. We cannot hope in freedom by 
just saying, well, let's just, let's just ignore our differences and let's just fight for freedom. It's not going to happen that way. God's testing us right now. The reason we're losing our freedom is because we've, we've stopped obeying his word. So again, the true liberty message is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the kingdom. That entails all the laws, all the principles of the kingdom. Not just this message, oh, just believe and be saved. That's only one aspect of being, um, one aspect of the good news of the kingdom. But the kingdom and its laws are in the entire Bible, the Old Testament. God didn't intend to ever do away with that. The sacrifice, the blood sacrifices and the rituals were never intended to really take away sin. You can find that, um, <clears throat> I don't think I have it written down, but you can do a Google search on it or search in a blue letter Bible or your concordance. I think it's in the book of Hosea and somewhere else in the New Testament, I think quoted by Paul, that the blood of goats and bulls, maybe it's in Hebrews, um, could not actually take away the sin. They only looked forward to that price that our Lord would pay upon the cross, that price of redemption, that price of, at uh, the, that price of, at price of redemption that atones. So that's why Christ said he came to fulfill the law because he came to actually put the law into effect where now sin could truly be forgiven, truly be covered over, whereas beforehand that was just a ritual that looked forward to Christ as being our sacrifice. The sin could not actually, um, <clears throat> in a sense, be forgiven until Christ paid that price. Um, that's important. Again, God never violates his own divine law. He never changes and says, well, I want you guys to follow the law, but I'm going to break the principles here and there. No, God, God's law is perfect. It was never designed imperfect. A lot of people have that mentality today. They think, oh, we got rid of that old law that was so hard on us. And, and um, no, it was the rituals that were a pain in the butt, so to speak. Having to go through all that ritualism of slaying the animal and, and shedding the blood for your blood and so forth, that was a pain. That was what was, you know, it was the rituals that were a burden. Not the actual law. Not the laws when it comes to even, even um, well, of murder, rape, and incest and things like that. And yes, even when people don't like to hear about it, adultery, idolatry, blasphemy. I say, oh, we can't live in those barbaric ages. Well, is God barbaric? Come on. All right, we're kind of sidestepping a little bit here, but that was the message. He was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. He was teaching the principles of the kingdom. Christ was. And he came to give people hope. <clears throat> and But here it goes. It says to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, you could take this in a figurative sense, I suppose, and I don't have a problem with that. But I also wonder, and I'm not going to say definitely whether I believe this to be true or not, but um, I also wonder if there's more of a, more of a literal aspect to this um, in the spiritual sense. I know that sounds, uh, sounds kind of confusing the way I said that, but let me read something that I think is sort of interesting. Now, uh, many of you have read this off of the blog we have. If you have the daily, if you're a subscriber to the Daily Mana, but I got a, I had a posting up there titled uh, "Where Did the Saints Go Before Christ's Crucifixion?" Now think about that. The Law of the Kinsman Redeemer states, as I quoted from before, that the person cannot be set free from slavery, from bondage, from servitude, from oppression until um, the price of redemption is paid. Now, why wouldn't that law carry forth for all of the people that lived before Christ? Think about that. Um, and why I say think about that is because we're going to read something here. I'm just going to read it. Um, well, I put on here, have you ever wondered where people like David, Isaiah, and Jeremiah went after, after death before Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the price of redemption? 
Well, and then I went on here and, well, I'll just read it. It says, well, there is a non-canonized book titled The Gospel of Nicodemus that gives an interesting account of this. Now, I'm not saying whether this book should be scripture or not, but I do think it's worth taking into account, at least to see if it aligns with or fills any gaps in scripture. For this book gives a supposed account of Jesus going into Hades while his flesh body lay three days in the tomb to rescue all those who believed in God from Adam all the way up to the time he was crucified. And um, I'm just going to say one thing about this book before I begin reading it. It is my opinion that this probably um, was a work of a scholar who knew God's word pretty well, and he was he was trying to <clears throat> teach some scriptures by um, using a, I don't know what you want to call it, using a, a made up story, so to speak, a parable, I guess, if you would, to teach this lesson. It, it, it just it it seems like that to me. Now, whether or not this is accurate or not, I'm going to leave that up to you to decide. And we're going to point a couple scriptures out. Um, concerning that, but you'll see why I'm going to read this in a second here. The book of Nicodemus, chapter 16, verse 1. <clears throat> and it reads, And while Satan and the prince of hell, or maybe more accurately, the prince of Hades, now when, when we read the word hell, now let's think about this for a minute. It's not always like, the, like we're thinking of a burning hell or people are burning and suffering forever and ever. It's probably... Uh, like it would probably likely be a place simply that was um, a place that was not paradise, another dominion that was not in the presence of God. Let me read about that. And while Satan and the prince of hell were discoursing thus to each other, on a sudden there was a voice as of thunder and rushing wind saying, Lift up your gates, O you princes, and be ye lift up, O everlasting gates, and the king of glory shall come in. When the prince of hell heard this, he said to Satan, Depart from me and be gone out of my habitations. If thou art a powerful warrior, fight with the king of glory. But what hast thou to do with him? And he cast him forth from his habitations. And the prince said to his impious officers, Shut the brass gates of cruelty and make them fast with iron bars and fight courageously, lest we be taken captives. But when all the company of, her, of saints heard this, they spake with a loud voice of anger to the prince of hell. Open thy gates that the king of glory may come in. And the divine prophet David cried out saying, Did not I when I was on earth truly prophesy and say, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men? For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder, he hath taken them because of their iniquity and because of their unrighteousness they are afflicted. After this another prophet, namely holy Isaiah, spake in like manner to all the saints, Did not I righteously prophesy to you when I was alive on earth? The dead men shall live, and thy, and they shall and rise again. I'm sorry. And they shall rise again who are in their graves, and they shall rejoice who are in the earth, for the dew which is from the Lord shall bring deliverance to them. And I said in another place, O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? Now some of these scriptures should sound familiar to you as we read them here. And I think this is a scholar trying to tell a story teaching us what these scriptures meant. Teaching us that... Um, Possibly those who, and, I, and I'm going to give a couple scriptures that may say, may say to, um, may contradict this for those of you who, who don't believe it this way. Um, and I'm not saying I believe it either way. I'm just trying to give you something to think about. Anyways, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But verse 12, when all the saints heard these things spoken by Isaiah, they said to the prince of hell, open now thy gates and take away thine iron bars for thou wilt be, now be bound and have no power. Then there was a great voice as, as, of thound, uh, as of the sound of thunder saying, Lift up your gates, O princes, and be lifted up, ye gates of hell, that the king of glory will enter in. 
Then we skip on down to 19 verse 1 of this book. And um, then Jesus stretched forth his hand and said, Come to me, all ye my saints who were created in my image, who were condemned by the tree of forbidden fruit and by the devil and death. Live now by the wood of the cross. The devil, the prince of this world, is overcome and death is conquered. Down to verse 8. In like manner, all the saints uh, prostrate at the feet of Jesus said with one voice, Thou art come, O Redeemer of the world, and hast actually accomplished all things which thou didst foretell by the law, by the law and the holy prophets. Thou hast redeemed the living by the cross, and art come down to us, that by the death of the cross thou mightest deliver us from hell, or Hades, and by thy power from death. Verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 1, Then the Lord, holding Adam by the hand, delivered him to Michael the archangel, and he led him into paradise, filled with mercy and glory. And two very ancient men met them and were asked by the saints, Who are ye, who have not yet been with us in hell, and have had your bodies placed in paradise? And one of them answering said, I am Enoch, who was translated by the word of God. And this man who is with me is Elijah the Tishbite, who was translated in a fiery chariot. Here we have hitherto been and have not tasted death, but are now about to return at the coming of the Antichrist, being armed with divine signs and miracles to engage him in the battle and to be slain by him in, at Jerusalem and to be taken up alive again into the clouds after three days and a half. And this was from page 83 to 87 of the Lost Books of the Bible and the Forgotten Books of Eden. And um, so you see that there, it's a very uh, interesting account anyways, and it contradicts probably what m most people believe or a lot of people believe as far as um, where the saints went um, just prior to, um, or where the saints went after death before Jesus Christ paid the price, the price of redemption. And um, anyways, there are a couple of scriptures. Basically what this is saying is this. And you probably got it by, by now, but this account of the book of Nicodemus is saying that the dead saints could not enter heaven and were likely in a place like Hades or, or, or whatever, some people call it hell, until our Lord paid the price on the cross. And then while he spent his three days in the tomb, he went down to this place to rescue all those who believed upon him or all those who served God throughout their lifetime and would accept the blood that he paid on the, on the cross. And um, so, by, again, by this account, they believe, um, this writer believes or is stating that uh, no one could enter paradise who lived before the death of Christ on the cross after they had lived here in the flesh body. And... The, a couple of verses, scriptures that um, many would point out, and um, and rightly so, that could refute this would be Ecclesiastes chapter twelve, verses six through seven, where it set, talks about the silver cord parting and the spirit returning to God who gave it. That's one place that that may contradict uh, this account here in the book of Nicodemus, and also the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And many of you are familiar with that. Where the uh, Lazarus was the poor beggar and, the, and, the, and he was taken into the bosom of Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. While the rich man was taken to the other side of the gulf, which some would call hell or whatever. That part that is not paradise in heaven. And he suffered, and he could, see, oh, he could see across the gulf, but could not go over there, could not be in the presence of Almighty God and his people. However, if we could possibly take away that account as applying the, the account of the parable of, of Lazarus and the rich man, of, um, 
of that applying before the crucifixion of Christ because Christ was actually, when he was giving that parable, he was speaking to, um, he was speaking to a rich man. And I think what he was saying is, when he was giving that parable, I think he was saying that this would apply to that rich man if he didn't get his act together. Go ahead and read the account and you'll see what I'm talking about. I, so I guess what I'm saying is the parable of Lazarus and the rich man may not necessarily contradict this uh, account from the book of Nicodemus. And uh, then that leaves us with the only true problem would be Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 or 7. Now, I'm not trying to make make something confusing here or, or cast doubt upon you know anybody's beliefs and you know how all this went down but it's always necessary to understand why we believe what we believe and check it out in the scriptures because you know what oftentimes when we learn something we take something and we say that's it and I'm gonna it's sealed and done it's finished I'm not gonna open my my, my mind to other scriptures and that's how the traditions of men work as well. Because people say, well, I already got it figured out. I already got it. And they close their mind to any scriptures that may say otherwise. So I guess what I'm saying is keep an open mind. Look at both sides. Because there are many scriptures, and I believe it's in uh, second, or First Peter chapter 3. I'm going to turn there. That suggests that there may have been the spirits in prison or the souls had to go into, um, they could not enter into paradise until the price was paid on the cross. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second here. Let's turn over first to um, a verse here that um, talks about that here. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, and it reads, For Christ also has suffered for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. There we go. That's the key, to bring us to God, to bring us into paradise, bring us into his presence by his death, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now think about that. Is that the same prison that Jesus was talking about here in Isaiah chapter 61 when he says, I, I've come to proclaim liberty unto the captives and to, um, and to open the prison to them that are bound? Now a lot of people say, well, that couldn't be fair. Why could David, why would David be in prison before Christ? David was a good guy. Well, he was also a sinner. So were all the other prophets. Everybody was a sinner. There was only one perfect, and that was our Lord Jesus Christ. So do they deserve to enter into the kingdom of heaven on their own free will? Or on their own merit, I should say, their own works? That doesn't make sense, does it? And when we think, well, God wouldn't make them suffer and wait a period of time um, um, to be able to enter into his presence... For David's case, I don't know what it would have been, a thousand years, Adam's longer, 4,000. But then we look at all the different examples in the Bible of captivity. We got uh, the children of Israel were 400 years in captivity in Egypt. There was the example of the 70-year captivity of Babylon. There were the Assyrian captivities. There was the captivity under Rome. All of those, I think, were examples, possibly, of what it means to be in this prison here that Christ is talking about. In other words, being in an area or a realm that is ruled over by an oppressor. In this case, according to the book of Nicodemus, he calls him the Prince of Hell. I think other books call him Beelzebub and, and so forth. But it's interesting to take into account. God has done this in the past. So it's not like, you know, even today, hey, we're living here. We're not in the presence of God. We're living in, uh, in a world that is um, under the control of the prince of the air right now at this time. We're living in bondage. So I guess for me, looking at it from that aspect of how could David or, and I'm not saying I, 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 this is the way it is. I'm not teaching this. I'm giving you some things to think about because um, 
I'm not satisfied with the accounts given on either side at this point. And I'm not ashamed to admit that. I don't know everything there is about the Bible, all scriptures. I study, I research just like you guys do, and I teach what I find out, what I learn. It's not embarrassing for me to say, I can't say it's this way for sure or not. Because once we try to act like we know everything and that all matters are sealed and cut off, we, sometimes we force ourselves to stop growing, stop learning. Now, I'm not saying we should go out in the boom, boom land and make all kinds of things into God's word that, that aren't there. But the fact is, there is this place that Christ talked about. Op this place that he talked about opening when he came. He came to proclaim liberty, to open the prison doors. And there's other verses in Isaiah and Ezekiel and all throughout the Bible and in the Psalms that talk about the, the prison doors of death and of bondage and so forth. And then we get to here in 1 Peter, it talks about the spirits in prison that Christ went to preach to, to proclaim liberty to. And so on. And another thing, another way I look at this is, again, all aspects, when we want to understand the Bible, it has to be according to his law. Now, I could be proven wrong on this, but legally it would seem to me that no one who had came through the flesh and died would be able to enter into paradise, into the presence of God, until the price of redemption was paid in full. Otherwise, it's, it's almost akin to, in my mind, of, of uh, saying they didn't need Christ. Or, or it, in a sense, it almost lightens what Christ did for us. But when you look at it the other way, it seems to me that it enriches the meaning of what Christ did. I mean, he actually freed people from, you could call it torment, so to speak, of being separated from Almighty God even for thousands of years, possibly. So at least think we should think about it. Because this is the time, the Passover, that we want to reflect upon the meaning of Christ's crucifixion, what it meant for us, what it did. I mean, it did all kinds of things for us. It... it um, it uh, reunited the house of Israel and the house of Judah under a new covenant. It gave us power over our enemies. And I could go on and on. It gives us forgiveness of sins here even on the earth. But also the resurrection. Because Passover is the time, to, again, to reflect upon the death and resurrection of Christ and what it means to us. It is the central piece of our religion. It's the central centerpiece of the entire Bible. And those who claim to go by the Old Testament and who reject Christ have completely missed out on the central, the central uh, piece of the Bible. That is the Passover lamb and the death and resurrection of our Lord. That's what this word is all about. And the things that it has done for us and has given us. Anyways, I could go on and on and talk about that, but I think we'll probably, well, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 61 and we'll read a little bit more in there because there's a couple other interesting verses there that, I, that I'd like to get to. And uh, here we go. So what else did he do? That wasn't all that he did. Verse 2, after he said he, he opened the prison to those that were bound, verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Do you know what that acceptable year is? That's the year of jubilee. That, that is the year that came every 50 years wherein uh, the, uh, all of the people were um, set free all of the captives were, but not only that, but all of their property was restored to them. If they had to mortgage homes and lands, hey, all that came back into their possession and into their family line so that it could keep being passed down as an inheritance. Um, that's an important aspect of that, the year of Jubilee. That's what Christ came to proclaim. Came to proclaim uh, 
that year. Anyways, you can find that that law of uh, the year of Jubilee in, um, I don't have it written down here and I can't remember it. But I've actually got uh, some studies about the year of Jubilee. If you go to, um, let me see here. If you go to that article I was talking about the relationship between law and prophecy, you should be able to find the details about the year of Jubilee and what that meant. It was, you know, it was the year that liberty was supposed to be proclaimed to all the inhabitants of the land. The year that all of counts were erased and everything set back to set back to zero. What a fascinating year. Anyways, um, again, you can go to that, the relationship between law and prophecy, or better yet, if you just type up, uh, type in the word liberty, or um, uh, I should say the, the year of uh, a jubilee, if you type in the word jubilee in our search bar, you should be able to find every study we've got that's related to that. There's the 490 times in principle and prophecy uh, blog on that, and, and all kinds of other things. Um, also, I must mention, for a deeper study on what Christ did for us and how he reunited the house of Israel and the house of Judah under a new covenant by his death and resurrection, um, Ephesians chapter 3, we have a video titled Ephesians chapter 3, The Mystery of Christ, as well as a blog titled um, The uh, Israelite Gentiles. In fact, the video is embedded in there. Anyways, enough uh, telling you about the different blogs we have on this. Let's get back to the scripture. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. This day of vengeance is looking to the future. It's the, it's the time of judgment. The time uh, when God is going to punish the beast system and the Antichrist. Some people call it the Great Tribulation. But that's at Christ's second advent, the day of vengeance. And that's, where, that's why Christ stopped reading after he said, I came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book. Dividing time up for us and letting us know that there would be two advents. To comfort all that more, and you'll find that in, um, I think it's Revelation chapter 5 or 9, 9, um, uh, Maybe it is chapter 5. Anyways, there's all, all these, um, actually maybe it's chapter, let me just turn there, because I don't want to mislead you. Revelation chapter 6, actually. During the fifth seal, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, in verse 9 of chapter 6 of Revelation, I saw the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest, yet for a little season, until their fellow servants and their brethren should be killed, as they were be fulfilled." That's speaking of the time of vengeance. Those are the people God wants to comfort, to comfort those that mourn. It's looking forward to the future. Um, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, uh, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And... Um, then it goes on and, and so forth. And I'm not going to read that at this time because I think we're going to close up at the, with this study right here. But I think it's fascinating when you look at the price that Christ paid for us as our kinsman redeemer to free us from bondage, to free us from slavery, and to give us everlasting life, to free us from the clutches of death, so that we can participate in the resurrection with him. And, um, well, I think we'll probably just close up with that. But, again, I think during this time we should reflect upon these matters. Reflect. Every Passover we should reflect upon 
the meaning of what, what Christ did at his death and resurrection and the power that he gave us along with that and uh, so forth. Well, I hope all of you had a joyous Passover um, this last week. And until next study, we're going to get back into the book of Deuteronomy again. Deuteronomy chapter 20, we're going to talk about the law of warfare. But until then, stay in his word. Keep studying his word. Do like Christ said in Matthew chapter 4 when he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The daily manna. So see that you, die, see that you consume it, digest it, meditate upon it, so that you can be a Christian overcomer. Christian Overcomers is brought to you by the tithes and offerings of our listeners. If you'd like to donate, you can do so by going to ChristianOvercomers.com. God bless you, and thank you for your support.